Mm -hmm. There's a laser point on that. <laughs> We are. Thanks for the warning. Sure. Okay. Yeah, if you want to. <laughs> let's, let's do that. Sign in sheet. We're asking everybody to sign in just for tracking purposes so we can capture everybody that's here. So we're excited to welcome back Chris Stewart for the second part of this presentation. Okay, take it away. Thanks, Marilyn. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, and thanks, Adam and Marilyn, and uh, everyone who is live streaming. And forgot to say hi to those those folks last time, but I had a lot of people stop me even on my way back and say, "Hey, I, I just watched I just watched you on the on YouTube." It was really bizarre, but uh, another bizarre thing, which I didn't know until Adam uh, told me, well, until this happened, and then Adam sent me a message and told me I was coming on the escalator one day a couple weeks ago or last week, I think it was. I don't know how long that poster's been out there, but it, it, uh, as I was coming down the escalator, there were people coming up right past the poster, and they were staring, they, they, they were staring at me, and I, I thought, well, do I have something on me? And then I get down there and see that, that big, that thing is huge. You guys did a nice job of advertising this so great PR well I want to make sure that we jump right in because we I had you know last time we were together I told you I had three main things I want to talk about and I gave you the opportunity to um, to give the order in which we would talk about those things those three main things were 
uh, culture, goals and habits, or discipline. And the whole purpose, the umbrella behind that, if you weren't here the first time, I don't want to regurgitate everything again, because we, again, have limited time and I could talk all afternoon, but it's in your sheet as well. So I, I'll, I'll let you look at the sheet. But the whole idea behind everything is that we want to try to do the, we want to do everything we can possibly do to be the best version of ourselves. And the reason why I focused it on you individually and not necessarily like your team or your workplace or the people that you work with is, is because we have to begin there if we want to have a great place where we work. It always begins with us. And so I'm actually really glad that you chose or those who were here last time chose goals and habits to be our first topic of conversation. Unfortunately, that's the only topic we got to. So thankfully, uh, I mean, th for me, I mean, I, I enjoy doing this. And so thankfully, uh, the classified Senate got back with me and said, hey, you want to do a follow up so we can actually finish and talk about culture and discipline? And I said, sure, let's do that. But then they said, they followed up with, you've got 45 minutes for culture and 45 minutes for discipline. So keep it at that. And so we're going to jump right in in that case. So what I want to do is I actually want to begin with culture. I want to talk about culture. And the reason I want to talk about culture and then discipline is because I think this is going to flow together really, really well. When we talk about culture, and I use the word culture, it, it's, it's not an easy thing to, I think, market a, a talk with. Like, for, for example, if you say, hey, somebody's going to give a talk on culture this afternoon, there probably aren't a lot of people, uh, you know, chomping at the bit to go and see that. Because one, we're not exactly sure what that might mean. I mean, what, what does it mean when we talk about culture? Who's culture? What kind of culture? The word culture is thrown around a whole lot. And I don't know that we always fully grasp what it is. And so I want to I want to pause for a second before we define, you know, culture for for our sake, for our conversation's sake. And I want to say something right now that's going to sort of provide the basis for everything else that I'm going to talk about in relationship to this particular topic of culture. And that is this. Um, organizations. And when I say organizations, I, I, I can mean anything that exists, you know, any group of people that exist for a purpose together. I mean, that could be your family, uh, a team that, that you're either that you coach or that you're part of. In my experience, I do a lot of coaching. And so I think in you know, everything that I bring to you, it, it begins for me. Usually these points begin for me or lessons that I've learned began for me in the context of a team as a coach and seeing and observing the way teams work. And then I bring them to, to work and I oversee a group of students, about 19 students who work for the Scripps College of Communication as ambassadors for the college. And I just kind of bring those same principles to them and create. And, and then what happens is, is in bringing that, those principles to them, it creates this thing that we're talking about right now called a culture. And so any organization or any team, any workplace, anything that, that we I use the word organization, that's what I'm talking about. Any group that you're involved with is, is they, organizations are not rational environments. If you're going to write something down, you want to think about it for a little bit, write that down. Organizations are not rational environments, but what they are, are emotional environments. We are, pe pe organizations are made up of people and people are emotional people. And I know that there are some people who don't necessarily like emotions or we don't, you know, we're not emotional people. We're more rational people. And so we, we tend to think, well, we, you know, I, I, I get annoyed by people who get all worked up with any, any emotional while other people really like emotions and they live by emotion and they, and they, they embrace emotions. And here, here's the point about that is that the world <laughs> that we live in and the cult, the, the organizations that we're part of don't care what you think. The, the world doesn't, doesn't care what, how you feel about, about the environment that you're in. The environment, the, the organization that you're in is not necessarily, it's not going to be a rational thing. And the reason I say that is this is because, when we deal with organizations, we talk about organizations. And so I'm getting ready to talk about culture and culture is something that exists among a group of people. And so this is something that you could apply directly to your workplace, directly to the office in which you're working, direct, directly to the group of people that you interact with every single day. When we talk about that, when we deal with organizations and we, we try to cha change the way we, we do things rationally and logically, then those, it, it rarely works. That kind of approach rarely works because we're, we don't operate that way. Though, we may, though organizations may be built on rational, rationality and rules and, and principles and operational procedures and things like that, that, that may be the things that are on our wall, the things that are in our documents, but it's not how we operate. We don't operate rationally. We operate emotionally. 
We op- you know, emotion tends to, to rule us. And so what that means is that if we're going to be really good at dealing with how to handle things in our organizations, how to handle things in our groups that we're involved with, then we've got to be pretty good. We have, to, we have to operate in the same way that organizations exist. And they tend to exist more emotionally than rationally. If we want, and, and so the point is, if you want to improve, if you want to improve your, if you want to have better results, better performance, better outcomes, then we have to, to, to put our finger on and make changes in the area that's actually going to create that. And it's not going to be a list of stuff on a document. It's going to be behavior, behaviors, actual ground level grassroots behavior. We've got to point to our behaviors and say, what, what, what are we actually doing? Because honestly, that's where culture is. That's what real culture is. Behavior is very, I think behavior can be simply defined by this, what you do, what you don't do, and how you do what you do and don't do. (laughs) I guess if you're not doing it, then there is no how to it. So what you do, what you don't do, and how you do what you do. All of behavior in life, and when I say behavior, I know people tend to think, well, you know, um, back when we were kids, you know, your mom or dad may have said, hey, behave. You know, I want you to have good behavior. And we tend to, 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 and we talk about discipline here in a little bit. Excuse me, we have a tendency to think of that in a negative way as well. I'm not talking about, hey, you need to behave as in good or bad. Behavior is everything that we do. It's decisions that we make, choices that we make. It's how we respond to circumstances that we, that we, that we experience every single day. So that's what I mean by behavior specifically. Success, your success, my success, our organization's success, your team's success. Success comes down to deciding what to do, what not to do, and how we're going to do what we're, what we're doing. Um, and so the question that, I wanna, that we need to ponder then is, what is it that drives our behavior when we're in those organizations, when we're operating in an organization? What's driving your behavior? What's driving, if you're, if you're overseeing employees, what's driving your employees' behavior? If you're in a classroom and you're trying to manage a classroom, what's, what's driving the behavior that's in there? If you're a coach of a team, if you're, if you're just part of a team, what's driving the behavior of you and your coworkers? The answer to that does come down to not strategy, not mission statements, not that I'm saying that any of these things are bad, not processes. We, can all, we all have processes for how we do things, not paychecks. I mean, not even paychecks are, are what drives behavior. I mean, because what happens is, I mean, if, if well, let's, I, I don't want to get on a tangent. Here's what drives behavior, culture, the culture that we have. And the cool thing about culture is it's actually reciprocal. What I mean by that is, is not only is culture driving our behavior, but our very behavior is the actual thing that creates the culture that we have. And so it, it, we have to figure out how all that works together and how to, if we want to improve it, how to, how to manage that and how to, how, to, how to actually practically do that. And so when I talk about culture, I really want to talk about it in a very practical way, all right? And so when I, when I, when I talk about culture, I'm saying that culture is driving the way we behave. Um, but when I say it's reciprocal, I mean that behavior is the thing that creates the actual culture that we have. And I say all of this to make the point that when we're talking about having culture, creating culture, living in a culture, hopefully you're know, trying to change culture, if we feel like we're in a bad culture, then, then feeling ends up becoming more powerful than hearing in a lot of times. I mean, not that we shouldn't express what we want the culture to be. That's what I believe is the role of the leaders. The leaders define what the culture is, but really the actual culture, it needs to be felt by those. I mean, you can feel culture when you walk in to a particular place. You walk into a restaurant, can you immediately feel the culture there? I mean, you walk into, I mean, right, if I say like Texas Roadhouse, what's the culture? I mean, you you, you feel it, right? Peanuts all over the place and it's just kind of, you know, just a relaxed atmosphere, right? There's a different kind of culture. There's, there, there, there is. I mean, that, that's, that's the way things work when in, in particular businesses. You walk into academic, you know, walk into a, a high school or an elementary school uh, from one place to the next. You can kind of feel and sense what the culture is. Culture is something that is very real. It's very tangible. It's so, it's, you, you can feel it. It's almost something, something that you can actually reach out and touch. And that's what, that's what we need to think about when we're talking about culture. That's why I say that culture becomes more of an emotional thing than, than a rational thing. 
what culture is not. Let's talk about what it's not for a second before we actually talk about the, the three things that, that it is. It's not uh, posters on the wall. We could put all the posters on the wall in the world with list of things that we want. I mean, buzzwords and things like that, but that's not really going to be our culture. I mean, it, 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 it could, again, it could define what we hope the culture is, but that's not culture. It's not vacation days policy. It's not casual jeans Friday, or, you know, we have, we have a popcorn Friday at the beginning of every month uh, in, in scripts and, you know, and it's, and it's, it's just part of an overall culture, but that's not what creates it. That's not it. It's not couches in the lobby. It's not, you know, new floor plans. It's not a fresh coat of paint. That's not what, that's not what culture really is. Culture is not something that is already present. And then, uh, you behave a certain way. Culture is created by all those that are in it. Culture is something that, that not, it doesn't come first. Behavior comes first, and then culture comes out of that. Culture is built out of that. And so when we think about culture, we got to think beyond the documents that we hand people and say, this is who we want to be, and we got to think about what's actually happening. And so this is the way we want to define it. Culture is what you believe, how you behave, and the actual experience that you are giving to somebody else and also receiving. And, and, and to, to make that a little more real, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll illustrate it. If you walk into, I, I mentioned this a second ago, if you walk into a restaurant, you can immediately feel its culture. Let's imagine that you hired somebody new here this week. Let's just imagine that, you, that you, you have a new hire and this person's coming on for the very first time, okay? When they walk in to, to your office or to your place of work for the very first time, they are going to have all of these things happen. What order do they come in? They, I, they actually come in the backwards order. They're gonna have an experience. When they walk in, they immediately get an experience. How do they get that experience? They get that experience by watching how everyone's behaving by observing your behavior the coworkers' behavior when someone talks to them they i mean they take it in i mean they're not necessarily consciously thinking about oh this is the culture but they're feeling it right that's what culture is okay and how you're behaving is actually a, di a direct result of what you really believe about this place that you're working in what you actually believe, how you, I mean, what you truly believe. And that's always going to happen. It always happens. It happens in every group, every team, every organization, every workplace. It's happening all the time. If we're giving each, where we are giving and receiving experiences. Those experiences are coming from our, the behaviors, our behaviors, and the way we behave. We are behaving the way we are behaving because of what we believe. And it's always happening. That's, that's, that's just the way culture works. And, you know, another great example of this. I mentioned that when you walk into a place, you can immediately feel its culture, right? There's, there's a, I had a, we, I, I have a, a friend who had to uh, have their, their newborn in the, um, uh, the, the neonatal intensive care unit. Uh, and, and so when you go into, into those, I mean, one, you want to have the confidence that the doctors and the professionals that are, that are dealing with your child, um, they know their stuff, right? But when I asked them about the experience, the first thing that they told me was, it was really awesome. It was a terrible experience that they had to have their child there, of course, but it was really awesome because those people were incredible. And what they kept coming back to was, they, they really loved, they, they loved us they loved our children. We could tell that they loved doing what they do. They loved us. And all the stories they told were wrapped around the, the, the love and the care that they gave to that family. I mean, they understand no one wants to be there. They're in a place that nobody wants to be. And so they, they have created, they've built this culture where you, when you're there, you truly feel like you're part of something that's, that's, that's greater. And it kind of takes your mind at ease a little bit from what the actual experience is that you're having there and the reason why you're there. I think that if someone... You know, I think, I think you could go into uh, one of those units and you'd have uh, the, the, the doctors and the professionals be the best in the world at being able to care for that child. And they, they actually make your child well. And you could leave and go back home and your experience then, if I ask you, how did it go? It could be, I don't ever want to go through that again. 
right? Because it's a horrible experience. But with the reason, it was amazing to me that they, that they actually focused on how, how caring it was and how loving it was. And the, re the reason why they focused on that, what they're actually telling me about is the culture of that place, the, a culture. And so how was that created? How was that done? And that's, that's kind of where we're headed, right? And, that's, and, and, and it's where we're headed in this talk today as we get closer to making the transition into discipline. But, but we need to understand that, that culture is built by every single person making it intentional choices like that to do that. All right, does that make sense? Okay, cool. I'm gonna take a drink here. Good. <laughs> I wanna say something too. I, I, I believe that, yeah, go ahead. So what's the, what's their belief in the neonatal, you know, the new people, what's their belief? So they should have some mission statement, something that's helped them to- In that, in that NICO unit, yeah. Um, I don't know what it was, but I can tell you this. I, I, I have recently, and this is a personal thing that I've done with my student ambassadors that I oversee. I'll answer the question like in, in an actual way of what I do and what our belief statement is. When, we, when I was first hired at Scripps, uh, one of my roles was to create a, an ambassador team who would, a, of students who would work on behalf of the dean's office so that they could uh, basically support and help with recruitment and you know we have a, a big welcome desk and so they they kind of do everything they can in schoonover center to help people feel welcome and to, and know that you know just 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 they, they do all kinds of things and so when we were creating this i say we because i actually had a student worker who was working with us that summer she was the first ambassador and so we created this vision together and I said, well, what we need to do is we need to actually create you know, the, our, the reason why we have this team. Why are we building it? And what is our purpose going to be? So what's, what, what is our true mission? And we created this, this statement. And it was really good, I thought. I mean, we had, it, had a, it, was, it was a long one page, pretty much a, almost a one page. It was you know, double space with outline type thing. But this is why we exist. This is what, we're, this is what our goal is. This, is. this is the kind of person that we're looking for to serve on the ambassador team. And so every time, every year, when we came around to hire new students, I would send that out, that email out to the, to, you know, to the entire student body in Scripps and say, we're looking to you know, uh, hire seven new ambassadors for this year. And, and then we'd get resumes back and things like that. And people, and I would ask them, did you read the job description? Did you read the mission statement? And, and when I interviewed them, they'd say yes. And of course, they can't really tell me anything about it. And so this past year, we were having a, uh, we had a we, we, I meet with them monthly, and I said, you know, I, I really appreciate the fact that we have, uh, we have an outline of, of who we feel like we should be as a group, as a, as a team, but how many of you really can tell me, I mean, even paraphrase to me what that says, and none of them really could. No, I mean, none of them, I mean, they, they, they get a few things in it, you know, and, and that, but it wasn't something that they really internalized. It was a, it was a statement on a piece of paper. And so I said, I want you to tell me what you think this, this role that you have as an ambassador is really about. And we're going to narrow it down to just a few words. And, and so they were giving me, you know, just things that they feel like they should do. You know, they, they said customer service. So I wrote, I wrote customer service. But I asked them, what's built inside of customer? You know, what makes a person a good customer service representative? They care. Okay. We wrote the word care down. And then they just were giving me a bunch of other things like that. And we came up, we came up with a new mission statement. And our new mission statement is three words, love, serve, and care. And I said, everything that we do, everything else that's on that sheet that, that we just, that we created a few years ago is encompassed with those three things. If you come to work every day and everything that you do is, is with the, the mission of doing, of doing those three things that you, that you love being here. If you don't love being here, come and tell me, because this is the job for you. If, you know, that, you're, that you're here because you really care about, if somebody comes to you with an issue, they may ask a, a question that you've heard a thousand times, but it's the first time they've asked it. You know, we have a big classroom that sits literally 20 feet from the desk, the welcome desk. It's 145, seats 272 people. Almost everybody on campus has had a class in that classroom. And every semester, when people have a class in there for the first time, they walk straight up to them. Where's 145? Well, 145 is right there. And, and, and so they get annoyed by that. And this is actually one of the things that triggered this particular conversation. I said, you know, we can't allow ourselves to get annoyed by that. You've got, you've got to understand, that's a big problem to that person. That's a big issue for them. For you, it's not. 
But you need to take that issue onto yourself right now and care about it, truly care about it. And when you do, that's going to cause you to get up out of your seat and walk them over and say, right, here's 145. You know, this is, this is, you know, this is the class. And tell them all about the classroom and everything else. And they're going to remember that. They're not, you know, even, even, even you, know, you could just say it's right there, right? But that's not a really a, a, a caring way to respond to that. And so we really try to build into the way we behave. We, we, it's, it's wrapped into those three words, love, serve, and care. And so that's kind of, I don't know what their mission statement would have been in that particular unit, but um, I suspect it was something like that. So does that answer the question? Oh, great, great, cool. Anybody else? Yeah, add to it. Say, Amazon, Apple, the customers at the center of their mission statement. So you might think it's about the product, mm -hmm. but it's never. It's about serving the customer. And so when you make it about the customer, or yeah. the client or the patient, then it becomes a very powerful piece. And then you know, like, I'm always there for them. Yeah. It's not about me. It's not about whatever. It's about and, and why is it? Why is it about the customer? Because it comes back to what we talked about at the beginning. Because because it's how they feel. <laughs> it's how they feel about what about what they what the experience they're getting, and and that feeling often drives their behavior. It's going to drive what they what they um, what they end up doing with with your product or whatever, whether they take it or not. Um, so when I, 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 I meant to go into and, and sort of define this a little bit more of what you believe, how you behave and the experience that we give. So when I say that culture begins with what you believe, basically, it's a couple of things. What, one, what do you believe about this organization? What do you believe about the work that you're doing? And then how that drives the way we behave. So every person, and this is, this is not just a, an organizational thing. This is just a personal thing. You're going to behave in alignment with what you believe about all of life, basically. You should be. I mean, well, you know, you, you are doing that. Your behavior is truly showing what you believe. And so we may not always know how to articulate our mission statement. We may not I always know how to, we may not always know how to articulate what our culture is, but all we have to do is hang out with some people for a little bit and we'll understand what. and their experience is going to come from how you perceive those behaviors. So not just the behavior, but, but how I perceive what's going on as well. So it comes back into body language and things like that. So the experience then becomes the actual culture, not the mission statement, not the posters on the wall, not the, and again, I'm not saying that mission statements are, are unimportant because we need to have a focus. It's, it may be like taking a, a, you know, a quiver of arrows out and saying, hey, I want you to shoot, shoot those arrows. Well, shoot at what? I need a target, you know, right? I mean, I can't just go shooting, but as soon as you put a target out there, now I can actually aim. I may not be able to hit it, but at least I'm going in the right direction. I think that's one of the things a mission statement helps us with. But the actual culture comes from the experience, not from our slogans and things like that. So um, I think one of the most difficult things for us in, in our country right now in, in, in the United States of America is that, and maybe one of the biggest problems in America today, is that we, when I say we, people, us, you and me, we are always way too reliant upon our environment to give us the energy that we need to do the things that we know we need to do. I, I mean, I, what I mean by that is we often, way too often, want, we, we choose behavior that's based off of how do I feel right now, right? How do I feel right now? And so, I, and even though I say that's what culture a lot of times is made, you know, when somebody comes into a culture, it's, it's, they're feeling it, right? We, we've got to, if we want to change culture, it's not always going to be what we want it to be. So what does that mean? I've got, I'm going to have to behave in a way that may be different than how I feel. And so we're not always going to be in environments where, where it, it is conducive to the types of behaviors that we want uh, to have, but we want our people to have. And the problem that, that I, see, I just see it over and over again is that people tend to, uh, they, they, they tend to pin all of their energy on whether or not they actually are in a, you know, uh, on the environment rather than on themselves. It, you know, I always kind of want to point it back to, 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 to ourselves and say, well, wait a minute, you create your own energy. 
You bring that energy with you. You figure out, you know, figure out how to create your own energy, bring it with you and into the environments, into our teams, into our workplaces, into our families, and then use that there to help change that environment and change the culture around you. Uh, you know, because here's the thing, no matter what environment you're in, environments drain our energy. They do. I mean, I mean, families, I, I feel like I have a good family, but you know what? Families can even drain our energy. I mean, they do. I mean, th teams will drain your energy. Envi I mean, th there, there are, there are good environments that we enjoy. I mean, why do people always talk about, I just need to veg for a minute, right? I need to chill. I need to, I need to sit back Be because we, we tend to operate most of our lives in environments of organizations or teams where, where, Things are being required of us and we need to serve and love and care. And so what's happening is it's draining us. And if all we ever did was make behavioral choices based on that, on the external environment, they would not, they would not be positive choices. We, you, you make positive choices because you find it in yourself to be, respond to things differently than the way you initially feel about it. And that's, that's, the, that's, the, way, that's the way it works. Uh, so I want to make sure that I'm moving along here. Okay. About a half an hour into culture. Good deal. So I can learn a lot about your culture, wherever you work. I can walk in. I can learn a lot about your culture just by coming in and interacting with it. But on the other hand, if I come in and you hand me a pamphlet or a document and say, this is what your, our, you know, this is what our culture is, it may or may not teach me anything about the culture in, in that place, right? Uh, I would suspect that almost every document in every organization, in every school in America has very similar language in defining their culture, right? What almost, I mean, every place you've ever worked, what are some of the buzzwords that are always in your, your mission statement documents or cultural documents, things like that? I, we could probably all name them and we'd have some very similar things. Name, think of a word. Somebody shoot one out, throw one out. Diversity. Yeah, we want, we want, we want, and again, these are not negative things. These are all very positive things, right? Does it always mean that there's diversity there? Of course not. We know better than that, right? We want to shoot for that, but, but just because it says it doesn't mean we have it. All right. What's, what's another one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty much the same thing right there, right? Collaboration, teamwork. We all believe in teamwork, right? Until someone disagrees with my idea <laughs> and then we believe in dictatorship, <laughs> but, but and collaboration, right? We, we believe in collaboration until, uh, in, until we get in there and, 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 and things start, people start butting heads. And it's like, okay, let's just do this on our, on our own, right? Uh, what else? What's, what are some more? Yeah, quality, excellence, right? Integrity. What's that? Excellence, yeah, yeah, yeah. E efficiency, effectiveness. Yeah, again, I, you, we could go across every, we could go in every single high school in the state of Ohio and say, give us your, your cultural document, your, whatever it is that they call it, right? Your, your mission statement. And we're going to see a lot of the same things. We're going to see ver the very similar things. They're not wildly different. Every organization has some version of, 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 of a cultural statement that includes those kinds of words. But the truth about culture is, as we've been discussing, is that what you really believe is what's going to determine how you truly behave and your behavior is truly the culture that we that we're finding that we have culture is real it's tangible it's it's it, it the purpose of culture is to drive behaviors that we want to produce uh to get the results that we desire it is something that that is that is uh uh, let me say this. Uh, this I'll, 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 I'll say one last thing here about culture. Maybe I might say more than one thing. Yeah. Culture does not exist, because I think this needs to be said, because I think sometimes we, um, when we think about culture, it's always, it's always feel good. I mean, we want culture to be a feel good place, right? And it needs to be a productive place, not just a feel good. So I, I, when I, what I'm getting, getting ready to say is this. It does, culture does not exist to make everybody feel good. It, it, doesn't, it, it exists to, to produce the results that you're hoping that you produce, right? That, that, and, and when we're producing results, it does feel pretty good, I think. I mean, I, 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 you know, I, as, as a coach, I look at our teams all the time and I say, listen, you know, it, there's, this, there's always this balance between, and especially depending on the age group that you're coaching and things like that, and it, gets, it, it changes as you get older and to different levels. But there's always this balance that you have to find between winning and having fun, 
right? Winning and having fun. And everybody says, well, you, you know, it's not about winning. It's about having fun. And then you have the real competitive ones that, are, that say, well, it's no fun to lose. And so, I, yeah, it is about winning, right? So we're going to play to win. And, and what I found is this, is that when people dedicate themselves, if, they're, if you're doing something, if you're playing a sport, for example, then if you dedicate yourselves to doing, to doing that sport really well, like you practice hard and you b- develop your skills and you work hard and you're very disciplined in that, then you're going to get better. And it actually becomes more fun to play the game because you're better at it. And when you get better, you find that you actually win more. And when you win, that's a lot more fun than losing. But it's not the poor purpose and the goal. It just It's a byproduct of the other things, of the behavior that got you there. And I think that that's where, you know, that's, that's the balance that we find in culture with teams and organizations. It's, it's very similar in organizations. And that is that, uh, that we don't create a culture just for the sake of making somebody feel good about, about, about being there. We, you know, it's not just about the way I feel when I'm here. I spend a lot of time talking about culture is the way you can feel it. I mean, when you walk in, you, you feel it when you walk in. And it's not just about that. What culture is about is about getting things done. Culture is, uh, is, is intended to you know, if you're going to fix the negative energy, if you've got negative energy in your culture, like complaining and blaming and excuse making and things we talked about last time, you know, things we want to eliminate in our, in our lives and the culture, culture is going to be the thing that says, hey, if you want to work here, if you want to exist in this, in this organization and you want to be part of our group, our organization, then this is the belief system that we, need, that we want you to have. This is, the, this is what we believe. This is who we are. This is our mission statement. And this is what you need to embrace. And then these are the behaviors that looks like that belief system. So this is what it really looks like. And if you, you know, this is stuff, this is stuff that you have to do. This is, this is, a, this is behavior that we expect of you. Now, if you're not very good at it, we're going to have a conversation about how to help make you better at this, right? And, and because we believe that this is, so when I say that leaders drive the cult, leaders determine the culture, they define the culture, that's what I mean. So if you're leading a group of people, you, you define it. You say, you bring people in, you say, okay, this, this is what we want. This is, how, this, this is the behavior that we know that we need to have to get the results that we desire. And so these, you know, this is what we want you to believe. This is how you behave. If you need help with that, we can help you with that. If you can't, the goal is to let them opt in or opt out. This is, this is who we want to be. Now you get to make the choice. If you can't, if you can't behave, if you can't operate with these behaviors, it just must mean that you don't really truly believe in what we're trying to do here. And then the question is, why would you want to work here? Why would you want to be part of this group? Why would you want to, you know, so, so you have the option then to opt out if you'd like. You're putting, you're putting the onus of the responsibility on them at that point to jump in to the culture with, with everything they've got. So that's why, I mean, culture exists to produce. I mean, ultimately, I mean, that's why, I mean, we, we want, you know, culture has a purpose. And that purpose is to produce the results that we, that we know that we need to have in our organization. And so when we, when we keep that in mind, then we realize that, okay, it's my job if you're a leader, it's my job as a leader to define the culture, to instill the belief system, to model the behavior, and to reinforce it. I mean, everything that I do is reinforcing it, it's permitting it, it's promoting it. All these behaviors that are part of our, our culture, we're creating it too. And then our behaviors are ultimately what creating or what is creating that culture. And every member of the organization is what drives that culture. And so whether you are a leader in the culture, or whether you're a member of the culture, go out of here today understanding that Everything you believe and do is helping to contribute to your culture negatively or positively. All right. Have we talked enough about that? I think so. Unless you got any questions or anything to add, we'll transition. <laughs> so for somebody who say is not in a leadership position, how would you tell them to sort of 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 changing yeah it is it is difficult and or that that's a difficult question a good question the question is for someone who is not in a leadership position just you know a member of an organization where there is negative culture how would you suggest to them to change the culture from i guess from the position that you have which is down here as opposed to up here and uh, one of the best ways that I think I could illustrate that would be 
when I was in college, I took a, um, it was like a, oh, I'm sorry. My phone is ringing. There we go. When I was in college, I took a, uh, a course in uh, church history. And I remember one of the church fathers, it, it, it'd be the, Christ, the Christian church back in, uh, I want to say it was Charles Wesley. So maybe back uh, several centuries ago stood up and said that if you want to create change, if you want to create a, a revival, I think is the word he said, here's how you do it. You go out into the sand and you draw a big circle in the sand and you say, I want everything inside that circle to change. And then you step inside and that's how it's done. And, and I really think that the same can be said for um, any organization. If I really want things to change, then, then I've got to do really well at myself. I've, I've got to really focus in even more on myself and make sure that I'm modeling that and that I'm not, I, I mean, making, I'm making the hard choice also of not participating in the negative behaviors that my coworkers might be participating in. The things that we talked about specifically last time, which are really simple, complaining, blaming, Excuse making, excuse making. Those things come up all the time. And sometimes it's hard because someone's, I mean, it just pops up. You might be just having lunch with somebody. Just, oh, wow. Wow. Where do, how do we get here? How do we start talking about this? And you just have to, you have to go, ah, that sounds like blaming, complaining, or excuse making. I get, and I'm really making a decision and effort to not do that, you know, so. I think that was an excellent point. Um, the question I have is when you're interviewing, companies tend to put their best foot forward. And the challenge is that you don't mm. usually know a lot of these things until you've taken the job. Mm -hmm. They sell themselves with that culture in mind that projects them positively. And you don't see the real deal until you're employed there for a while. It's like you don't truly know someone until you live with them. Yeah. That kind of a scenario where you either decide to you can't even join them or you're trying to be that change agent in an environment where people, this is the norm and this is how we do things. So that's, but I think you that is a answer that. But you're right. I mean, and, and there may not I mean that's just a great comment that I really don't have a, anything to add or I, I, there's no answer to that. I mean, you know, the, the very fact is true that sometimes you find yourself in a situation that you were that you were, you know, it was unintentional on your part. If you had known more, if you'd had more information, you know, as in they, you know, they say when you go to an interview, you're not just being interviewed. You're also interviewing the company as well. Um, then you wouldn't have made the decision to take that job because of the culture and that you didn't know because they put their front, their best foot forward. And so that, that becomes a really unfortunate situation that sometimes we all find ourselves in. And then hopefully then you, you, you find other options that come up, you know, you do your best you can for the long, as long as you can to give them what you have. And then, and then, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a tough thing. It, and it's, it's a reality that we live in too. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe we can answer some of that also if we talk a little bit about, about discipline and what discipline is. This is another one of those words that we have to reclaim. We have to talk about it for what it actually means because it's often viewed, again, in a negative light. People talk about discipline in the same vein as punishment and rules. You know, we, when, I mean, what, does someone, what do people usually say whenever things seem like in chaos? We need more discipline around here, right? right? That, you know, that child needs more discipline. <laughs> Meaning that child needs beat, or that child. Needs, I'm, I'm teasing about that. That child needs. That child needs more discipline. We tend to think negatively about it, right? Uh, we we tend to think in you know of of that word in that way, and so every time someone mentions discipline, it always has a negative connotation. And and I really one of my goals is is to try to change the way we think about that word because words are so important. I mean, if you really take the word discipline and you break it down, you have you know words like disciple, and disciple comes from the Latin word disi uh, dis disciplus, I think, and it means student. Um, most people believe that a disciple is a, is a follower because we tend to think back, you know, we tend to think in biblical days where disciple, Jesus had disciples. And so you tend to think of them as followers, but disciple is truly in its truest form as a student, it's someone who's not only a student, but a student who chooses learning on his own. He chooses who he's going to learn under. He chooses, you know, she'll choose who she's going to learn. So that learning is an ongoing thing that they're choosing for themselves. That's what a real disciple is. And it's in where that word comes from. So we get our word discipline from that. Um, the word itself, discipline is from the Latin word disciplina, which means instruction or training. So again, it comes back to 
instruction, education, learning, discipline is, is gaining something. You're always gaining. You're looking to gain something more. And so what discipline then actually is, which I need to get to it here on our screen. I can get to it just directly without, I had to skip the goals. Is there's, there's a few things here, and I'm just going to leave that, that slide up there because I'm going to talk about all, all six of those things, and we're going to contrast them, uh, compare and contrast them. But the way I see discipline is, is, is that it is an ongoing learning experience. It's an ongoing thing that we choose for ourselves, ongoing learning that every person chooses for themselves. And when I, what I mean by learning is when we're learning, hopefully we're internalizing the things that we're learning and they're causing us to be better at who we are. Again, the goal here, how can I become the best version of myself? And I, here's the answer, with discipline, with discipline. Now, if I were to, we, it'd be, it's hard to create a commercial about that and a poster about that, right? He's talking about culture and discipline. Who wants to go listen to that, right? Because it's a, it sounds, we don't know what culture is, but we know what discipline is, and that's negative. I don't want, I don't want to talk about discipline. I don't need more discipline. Discipline is a, is a, is a rough thing. Discipline is not a negative thing. It should never be viewed in a negative light. In fact, what is the one thing that every, any of you that have raised teenagers, what's the one thing that every teenager wants? Freedom, <laughs> right? They, want, they all want more freedom. They want more independence. And as someone who has raised, raised two, teenager, two teenagers, I can tell you this. My kids got more freedom when I saw that they were themselves were more disciplined. When they could not when they did not make disciplined choices, I had to make them for them. That's what, you know, that's what governments, I, I want less government in my family. I want, I want to make sure that my kids are able to govern themselves, but they couldn't when they were younger. And so there's all kinds of discipline then, right? There's all kinds of things. And I'm not talking about rules and punishment. I'm just talking about guidance and helping them learn the proper things that they needed to know to get, to get along in this life, to be safe in this life, to have to, have, you know, to be able to be successful in this life. And so the more disciplined behaviors they were able to, you know, to show us, the more freedom they got. And that's, that's, that's the key, is the more disciplined a person is, the more freedom we're going to find that we have. Those are two words that seem very antithetical, but they're actually really closely related. Disciplined behavior is what brings freedom. Um, it's what everybody wants, not just kids. It's not just, I mean, teenagers want it. I want it too. I want more freedom. I want more freedom. You know, we would all love to have more financial freedom. How do you get financial freedom? Got to be more disciplined with our finances, right? I mean, the more disciplined we are early on with our finances, the more freedom we're going to have to do whatever you want with what you've made. If we're not very disciplined, you're not going to have much freedom because you're going to be locked in paycheck to paycheck. It's just a natural order of things. I want more, I mean, uh, discipline, I, I want more time. How many of us ever feel like I don't have enough time? There's not enough time. That's not true. We all have the same amount of time, right? People who are successful have 24 hours in a day. People who are unsuccessful have 24 hours in a day. Time is not something that you create. It's like, I, I, hate, I always hate it when someone says, hey, you need to, you need to make time for this, right? We need to, I, we, I, my students, they hear me say this all the time because they're like, oh, I need more time. You've got the same amount of time I have, right? And so the issue isn't you need to make time with it. Here's how we got to think about time. Use it wisely. How you use time is the key issue. Not how, not, nobody's creating time. We're not putting more, adding more hours or minutes to our day. But how you use it is the key. I mean, that's, that's really all of life. I mean, when somebody, Adam, one of the greatest compliments that, that you told me when we went to lunch last week or two weeks ago was that somebody told you that this was a useful workshop. And that was that stuck with me because my goal in life is to be useful. I don't want to. I don't want to do something just just to do it, right? I want to make sure that we're that we're useful in life. And so it, that same issue should be the same thing with time. That that if you want if you want more time, then you know then you've got to be disciplined with how you manage it. And when you're disciplined with how you manage your time, then you end up with more time and not, you don't really have more of it. You just, you just, you have used it better. And so you feel like you have more time and that's a, that's, you know, so discipline then becomes the pathway to freedom in every single aspect of life. If you want more freedom, you need to use more discipline. And it sounds odd to say it that way instead of saying like, get more discipline, because again, I don't think discipline is something that we get more of. I have as much discipline as everybody in this room. You have as much discipline as I do. Are you using it or not? That's the difference. We all have discipline. It's how you're using it. Are you using it or are you not using it? That's the key right here, okay? So 
if we connect discipline to culture, which is something that we're going to try to try to do here before we before we you know, wrap up here this afternoon, when we're connecting discipline to culture uh, and we want to create positive cultures in all the organizations and groups and teams and and workplaces that we're part of, then uh, then that means it comes from us being more disciplined me being more disciplined. It comes from all of our people being more disciplined in how we make our choices, how we respond to things. No, and, and discipline is something that doesn't come natural. It's not something that everyone aspires to, uh, to do. It's, not, it, it actually, it's antithetical to our normal behavior. Our normal behavior tends to be what we will call uh, more of a default behavior or an impulsive behavior. Discipline is something that we have to choose. And so that's why it's not easy, because we have to choose every single day discipline. And so if we were to define what discipline is uh, versus what discipline is not, I would go, these are the things that discipline is, and this is the opposite of discipline, which would, I, we would just call it our default behavior as human beings. Because every morning we wake up and we have two choices. We could live by default, or we can live a disciplined life. And, and, I, and I'll tell you, this hit me this morning. Uh, this is it did because uh, you know I I create I made a decision a couple years ago to have better time management. I think I told you guys this story last time. Uh, maybe I don't know. I remember I don't remember who I told this to, but somebody. Uh, and so one of the this, one of the decisions I made was that I was going to get up earlier in the morning to get things done in the morning when it's just me, it's quiet, that, and there's just there's no distractions. And then when I got a few things done, then I would go work out at WellWorks as soon as they open. And then, uh, and then I'd, you know, to get a shower and get to work and, and then have more time. If I'm getting up that early, though, that means I've got to go to bed earlier as well. And so I had to kind of rearrange things. And so this morning, five or 4.45, the alarm goes off like it does every day. And I went, man, I was up late last night. I had a softball game. It was senior night. It was a lot of fun, you know, and so it was later night. So I ended up with getting maybe four hours of sleep instead. And I did not want to get up. I was, I, everything inside me was going, I need, I need the sleep. I need the sleep. And then I remembered, I got to talk today on discipline. <laughs> and so, and so I got my butt out of bed. <laughs> so, but that's, I mean, it's, it's not our natural response. Our, our, we have to make ourselves choose it. And so what I want to do is I want to I help give us sort of a framework for what, you know, how we can view discipline by just contrasting it with these, with these words here. So our default way of living is in this column, but our disciplined way of living is in this column. So let's just contrast intentional with impulsive. That's the first battle that we face, that, that the, the, the battle of every day, am I going to be intentional about the things that I do? Or I'm just, or am I going to allow impulse to just, to just kind of guide me throughout the day? Uh, am I going to be purposeful with my, with, with the things that I choose to do, or am I just going to live on autopilot? We may see, you know, see those two very similar. They are kind of similar. And then the last one will be, am I going to choose to be skillful in the way I operate and behave or resistant in, uh, in life? Because life is always changing. I think, if I were to ask every single one of us, if you ask everybody, would the quality of your life, I mean, we're talking about discipline. I mean, everybody has a choice. I mean, we, 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 people could say, ah, you know, I'm fine with where I'm at. Okay, if you're fine with where you're at, that's good. But I think a lot of people want to improve. I would assume that almost everybody wants to improve. And so if I were to ask the question, would the quality of your life improve, get worse, or just have no impact either way, if you had more discipline, if you had more discipline in your life, what would the answer be? Well, of course, it would improve, right? I mean, I'd say I, I'll 99, I, I won't say 100% of people because there's probably still that 1% of people would say, no, my, I mean, you know, I, I, it, they wouldn't answer, uh, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't get better at all. Or it wouldn't, I think we all understand that it, it would get better. It would get, if we had more discipline, if we use discipline more in our lives. And so, here is then, I guess, another definition of discipline that I really like that I kind of alluded to earlier, and that is this. Brian, I, I, learned, I got this from Brian Kane. He's a motivational guy. He works with, with a lot of sports teams, and, uh, and, and I listen to his podcast. I got to see him at a clinic one time in Columbus for coaches, and he said this. I mean, it was a really, really simple statement, but he said, here's the key to every single day being disciplined in your life, and that's this. Act different than you feel. Just act different than you feel. 
I mean, act differently than you feel because almost all the time we don't feel like doing something. And I remember when I, a few years ago, when I, stir, when I first created a, uh, um, a regular, you know, from September all the way to the first part of the season, which begins in the sec- uh, third week of, uh, of February, a, a strength and conditioning program for our baseball team. I, I said, you know, I, get, I told them, I said, listen, I want to make sure that we can have as many guys here as often as possible. And so this is when we're going to do it, six o'clock in the morning before school. There's showers right across in the, in the we call it the doghouse, right across from the, uh, the, the Reed Strength and Conditioning Center. Everybody can get a shower there if you want. If you live close, you've got time to go home and get back up, but you don't have any excuse. You can get here. Well, the first, the first week, they're kind of excited about because it, it was something new or whatever. And after that first week, it was, it was hard. It was, it was difficult, right? And so I had to bring this out. I'm like, listen, I don't feel like getting up and coming out here either every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. This morning, I didn't feel like getting up and, and doing my, my little routine and going to work out either. But what the key to a disciplined life is, act differently than I feel. We don't always feel like responding positively to people when they're negative to us. Act different than you feel. If, you, if we just keep that simple little statement in our mind all the time, write it down, put it in front of you, put it on your computer screen, whatever, then it will, it, that alone will change the way our culture you know, because the, the only way you can change culture is, again, we all have behavior experts say that everybody has like 20 square feet that you can that you can actually control. Right. That we, every single one of us have about 20 square feet in our lives that we actually control. That's how you change culture is you change what's in that 20 square. You you own that. You focus on what you can control and we can always control to act differently than we feel. We always can. So let's go to this first battle. It is a process, I'll say that. It's not just something, I mean, you have to, because we're going to fail. But, I mean, we're not always, we're going to respond negatively sometimes. But the difference is when you have made a decision to act differently than you feel and you fail, you remind yourself, oh, I don't want to do that. Whereas before, you'd have just stayed in default. You'd have been, well, that's just who I am. No, it's not who you are. You can be better. You can do better. And so let's talk about that first battle of intention versus impulse. This is the difference between being, uh, being thoughtful um, you know, making a well thought out decision, you know, a well thought out response when something happens versus just going with your first reaction. That's basically the difference. That's all, you know, intentional versus impulse. It is so easy to just go with your first instinct. Have you ever gotten ready to, on social media, make a response, right? Or you read something and before you even stop and to think about it for a second, you already start the comment right? The good thing about that is as you're typing, you're probably thinking about it. And all of us have probably sat there and had a chance right before that moment, right before we hit shift or enter, whatever, you know, enter or send right before that, there's that little moment of, should I do this? Right? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Delete or enter. Yeah. And sometimes it's not even a bad thing to write all that out and then delete it. You know, I've done that before. I've written, I've written letters or emails and then never sent them. Just deleted them, got rid of it because I, I'm more, I, I like to write. I like, I get my thoughts out and I can think clearly that way. And so sometimes that happens. But what happens is all of us, I think, I don't know about everybody, but most people have this little voice inside our brains that when we get ready to respond impulsively, there's something that sometimes will trigger. And the better we get at this, the louder that voice will get that says, stop. Don't do that, right? Press pause for a second. And, and that's it. That's discipline. I mean, sometimes that's all discipline is, okay? And so, and so when you have that thought, that's discipline. We got to remember, that's the disciplined response. Listen to that. Don't, don't go with the impulse. That's the difference. So we're talking about, the, you know, your discipline is telling you, be intentional here. Don't be impulsive. Impulsive is saying the thing that you want to say, right, right off the bat, or responding impulsively. Now, what you, if you're intentional, if you step back and you press pause and you think about your response, you prepare it, it may be pretty similar to what your impulsive response was going to be. Sometimes, usually it's not. Most of the time it's not. Sometimes it might be. I'm not saying that, that, that that's always going to be something that you shouldn't say. I mean, if there's, if there's conflict you shouldn't avoid, it's not something that you need to deal with, and you need to deal with it. But for the most part, our impulsive responses are not good. They're not positive. Yeah. I was going to say, um, Abraham Lincoln wrote plenty of letters <laughs> to generals that he knows. He did. That's a great <laughs> point. He did. Um, and so he, he practiced that intentionally all the time. Yeah. Um, he could have caused a lot of problems. Yeah. See. <laughs> Yeah, and we could probably all contrast that with somebody. We won't go there. So, 
Yeah. Boy, we miss Abraham Lincoln. Never knew him. <laughs> so, yeah, again, it comes back to everybody has discipline, I think. I really think that that voice does trigger in everybody's mind. It's just that some people are stronger at it than others. And that's why discipline's a muscle. We got to work it out. We got to get better. That's, I mean, that's kind of the point we're getting to down here. We got to get more skilled at discipline, at having disciplined behaviors and disciplined responses. Um, I, I yeah. Intentional versus impulsive. Impulsive is kind of like that instant gratification. Because that mm -hmm. I don't I don't have necessarily the voice, but I have the the moment where I go, is this email gonna cause me more trouble mm -hmm. than it feels good about sending it? <laughs> right. <laughs> and right. Then I'm like, yeah, yeah, send it. <laughs> yeah. And that's like my intentional choice of going, I don't want to deal with the fallout of this. Yeah. Like yeah. Right, now, but, right. And know. it's not all it, again, and that that like that, it's not always real clear. Yeah, is it? I mean, sometimes it's not, it's like, well, some of the things I said needs to be said, but yeah. does it need to be said in this way? You know, can it, can I, would uh, take her out for a cup of coffee be better or something? You know? Yeah. Yeah. But so, yeah, I, I that happened. I mean, and it happens in simple ways too. I mean, like if you want to, if you're, if you're trying to be better with nutrition, you know, like I, I drive through Tim Hortons almost every day or, you know, get some kind of coffee, Brennan's or somewhere at the, the court street coffee. And every time you go to one of those places, you got the pastry staring you right in the face. And there's Brennan's pastries are phenomenal. I mean, they're Those cookies are huge. They're incredible. And so is it just coffee or is it, you know, every, every day is a coffee and the cookie, right? So that every day it's that, it's that, it's that, okay, I'm going to be impulsive and just buy the cookie or, intentional and say no to that those kinds of things so that's i mean it happens with silly small things but also happens with big things and in everything i think the better we get at the small things that the better we become at the bigger things too at, at recognizing being intentional in that way so i, I want to make sure that i say this too because i, I kind of put down um i mean i a lot of people live by emotion i talked about how you know how we are, uh, we we operate more by the way we feel in a certain environment as opposed to you know discipline. I'm not saying that we we should deny or repress emotions altogether. Emotion in and of itself isn't bad. What I what I mean by what I what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that um, that in in not being you know not being guided by your emotions. Uh, means to harness the emotions that we have in the moment when we have strong emotion to make an impulsive response and get our emotions working for us rather than against us. I, I think because if it, it, you know, emotion can be a really, a really positive thing, but sometimes our emotions are what creates a lot of the problems. And so I think a person who's an emotional person has to learn how to harness that emotion and, and use it in a very positive way. And, and I, I'm, trying, I'm trying to, as I'm saying that, I'm trying to think of an example that might be a good one. If you guys can think of a good one. Yeah. Um, mm. And when you're trying to change things, um, there's a really great book called Switch by uh, Chip and Dan Heap. And um, mm. he talks about uh, a human being being two kind of encompassing uh, figures. It's the rational mind, which is the writer, and then there's the emotional side, which is the elephant. And the size discrepancy is very intentional um, because your emotional side tends to be that much greater. Um, than your rational side, but the elephant's not going to go in the right direction if the writer isn't directing it, and the writer can't get any well if the elephant's not on board. So it's one of those things hmm. where it is a balance between the two of them, but they, they mentioned very distinctly that like you have to have an emotional tie to a change yeah. to impactfully be changed for good. Yeah. Um, so it is important to be emotional, it's just um, the balance, yeah. understanding how yeah. much more powerful your emotions can really be. Um, against your rational side of what you yeah you know, everybody's had a moment where they go i shouldn't have said that exactly I have said that. yeah that was not yeah choices. um and it's sort of to reconciling of like being able to identify that in the moment and separate yourself from whether or not this is an emotional reaction or if this is like how i'm actually feeling about hmm. this concept in, in total yeah um, because you're that, that's what i see it as um and and the feeling a lot of times is not the truth about the situation. Yeah. As you're saying that, I'm actually thinking of an example that I, that I have used, that I do use with, with, with again, coming back to sports and teams. Whenever a, a team is getting ready to go into a very big game that has a lot of stakes to it, like a championship game or something, you, you get a lot more nervous than, than, than you normally would. And, and, and these butterflies start flying you know, in your gut and everything. I remember a, a few years ago,
two years ago, well, uh, two years ago and three years ago, two years in a row, we actually, the team that I was coaching was in the regional championship, and it was in May, and it was after all the students, in fact, like the week after finals is when this, you know, is when this took place, and nobody was here, and there was very little going on. I needed a lot of work because I was a nervous wreck mm-hmm. on the day of the game, and, but I didn't have a lot of work to do, and so I, I, I'm just thinking constantly about this, and so the butterflies were just, I was nauseous, and, I was, and, and so I would just go out and walk around, and, and I had this thought that butterflies and nervousness, you know, those emotions aren't negative things. And I mean, they feel negative, but, but what I need to learn how to do is to harness those things and kind of, I, I, the way I put it with our teams was, you know, if you've got butterflies, that's good. Let's just get them all flying in the same direction. Let's just, let's just get, you know, that's, you know, that's, you, and, and what, that, what that does is it puts, us, it puts in our mind that we're in control of even that. I mean, you know, I'm not in control of, of the fact that I'm nervous. But what I can be in control of is is not allowing that to lie to me. You know, there, what, there, sometimes we get nervous because we think we're not worthy enough, or I'm not going to be able to to compete at the level I need to compete, or whatever. And you remind yourself, I am very prepared for this. I can do this. And in doing that, it's getting those. It's like it's, you're not getting rid of the nerve, but then now they're flying in the same direction. They're not just. It's not chaotic. I'm in control of it, and I'm focusing on what I can control. And so, and so, uh, so yeah. I guess I guess that can be. And I think that, you know, one of, the, one of the things that discipline comes down to is this, and that all of these things do, it comes down to this, that every person in the world, we, we do in, in many, many ways, in almost every way, at least in our character and in who we are as a person, our integrity, we get to choose what kind of person we want to be. And, and, and what I mean by that is it happens in all of these little choices. It happens in all of these little moments where we're going to be impulsive or we're going to be intentional. It's creating who we are, and we get to choose that. That should be a really, I mean, that should be a really, you know, freeing thing to know that I get to choose the kind of person that I want to be. We don't get a chance, we don't get to choose the kinds of things that come to us. And I think that that's sometimes, someone immediately might think, well, eh, not everybody gets to choose. Listen, I understand there are a lot of people who do not get to choose the events that come to them in their life. One of the greatest books I've ever read um, was, uh, uh, oh my gosh, my mind went blank. I can't believe it went blank on this one. It's one of the greatest books I've ever read. Um, who wrote the uh, the book about the uh, the um, uh, the Jewish prison camps in Austria? Um, um, uh, um, 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 yeah. Um, yes. Oh no, 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 a different one. Yeah, that's a good one too. But um, oh, he's a psychologist, and he actually studied he studied people's behavior and the way they were responding to. Oh, um, sounds really good. Um, yeah, I know you're talking about. <laughs> it's got the word man. Man, man search for meaning. Man search for meaning by um, someone. Oh God. I, I, I've, I've been talking about so many things here. So yeah, just look it up. Man search for meaning by. Shh, it's going to come to me. But it's a uh, it's a complete study on uh, where we are. The, what we are actually in control. Who is it? Victor Frankel. Yes, goodness, Victor Frankel. Yeah, um, absolutely gripping. It is not an easy read never read it, uh, it, it it's, it's, it's thin, I mean, it's, it doesn't take long to read it, but it is heart-wrenching, and it's, it's, it's tough, and the reason it's tough is because he observed, and he basically did an entire, he, you know, he built an entire um, theory of psychology around uh, the fact that, that, you know, this whole idea is, is we, we get, we have, we do have choices, I get to choose the way I perceive what's happening around me, and the way a person chose to perceive it determined whether or not basically how long they were going to live or not in that situation, in those prison camps. Because once they decided that this is, I mean, that it's, it's over, I mean, they, they got sick and they died, but, but, but the person who chose differently, there's also a great movie on that, The Meaning of Life, is where we're at, on The Meaning of Life. Life is beautiful. Like, yeah. <laughs> the Meaning of Life is a completely different point <laughs> of But Life is Beautiful uh, is, is a really, really good movie um, that, that, that where the guy basically chooses to create a different reality than the one he was in um, for his child. Um, so his child would, would not realize that they were actually in, in prison. But, um, but you know, all the experiences we have, we don't get a chance. I mean, events come to us, and we don't get a choice of that. And really, events will create outcomes. I think I've talked about this before, that the event plus the response to the event equals the outcome. You know, I, I first read that in um, John Gordon's book, The Energy Bus, and then uh, uh, Tim and Brian Kite talk up. That's their, that's their whole thing. They, they go and give entire presentations at schools about this whole formula of E plus R equals O, and that R is the most important thing. That is, you always get to choose the way you respond to every event. 
And a lot of times, that way you respond has an impact on the outcome as well. It may not change it a lot. Sometimes it does change it a lot, but we do always influence it, either positively or negatively, based on our response. And every person in every circumstance, I don't care how good or positive or negative the circumstance is, we always get to choose how we're going to respond. Yeah. I don't know if you have a chance to watch that with Ricky Mantle video. Uh, he talks about this in one thing where he talks about responsibility. He breaks down his responsibility mm -hmm. and says um, you could ask for more capability to do something in any kind of scenario. Do you feel that yes. you actually have right. ability? Right. And then that. what is your response? Yeah. And that is what a responsibility is. Yeah. It is. Um, yeah. And so it's like your choice to how you're going to respond to this scenario if you have the ability to do it. If you don't have the ability to do it, you don't have the ability to do it. Yeah. <laughs> that's, exactly. that's just what it is. Exactly. But if, if you have any ability at all, to then, then, it, then yeah, do your response is what your response is and what you have to live with going forward. Yeah. When you think about it, is that choice you made. Yeah. What, what, what was the video again? I can't remember. Uh, Richard Mental. He, he was yeah. doing a talk. Um, he's a veteran. And, I remember you told me about uh, that. Um, it's a really inspiring little talk, and it's a great way to quickly think about yeah. that whenever you're in a scenario is to think, can I do something? Okay, well, yeah. and what am I going to do? Yeah. Um, and I think about it because I've actually had experiences on campus where I've been um, walking around and I actually saw a young woman get hit by a car. Oh, my goodness. By a drunk driver. And um, me and one other person ran straight to her. Do I have the ability to do something? Um, yes. And yeah. it was like our yeah. first reaction. We ran up to her right away. We're like, can we help you up? Do you need to mm. stay? <laughs> um, yeah. And I look back and I see a line of people who had seen it and all of them were on their phone texting and yeah. taking pictures. Yeah, and I looked yeah. at anybody take a picture of the license plate and they were like, and everybody just went looked down. And yeah. I was like, that, that yeah. is like, if you didn't have the ability to respond here, if you're willing, you could have taken a picture and yeah. that would help in this scenario. Yeah. So, and, then, um, and it shows you the difference in the kind of responsibility, you know, yeah. that was taken versus the irresponsibility with the... Yeah, the, so it's, it's always, because I see a lot of that with students here and stuff like that and get that right. to see a first hand of like when you would be confronted with sort of that evolution yeah. and thought process of when people start to kind of right. take that on themselves as, as a part of their their uh, their personalities and um, so something I think about a lot. Yeah, that's good. It's awesome when you think about that actually. So well cool. Let's see. Let's get to these. Let's go ahead and get to these at least the next two contracts. This one's not gonna take long at all. Because it's a lot like intentionality versus impulsive, impulsiveness. Purposeful versus autopilot, being purposeful versus living on autopilot. Basically, the difference between um, those two things is the difference between doing what needs to be done versus just living in the comfort zone. They're all, every day there are things that we know need to be done versus I don't really want to do those things right now I mean, because it's uncomfortable for me. And so I would rather just be comfortable. And so. That's the difference. I mean, that really, I mean, so discipline, this is the discipline response. This is the undisciplined response. This is the default response. The default response is to just live in the comfort zone. And I will say this, a lot of people can live in the comfort zone and be fairly productive. I mean, a lot of people are semi-productive in the comfort zone, and sometimes they're productive enough in the comfort zone that they can just stay there all their lives. And if that's where you choose to be, then understand that that's, 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 that's as good as it's going to get for you, right? But the, the, the only way it's going to get better is by embracing productive discomfort, being purposeful in, in things that, that you know need to be done. Um, autopilot tends to become um, what happens to us when we become really familiar with things. You know, we, you, you, you get, I mean, you've done this before driving. You've, gotten, you've gone from one place to the next, and it might be a trip that you've made a hundred times. And you get there and you go, I don't even remember that drive. Your mind was somewhere else. It was autopilot. Everything happened. You know, you, and we, go, we can go through an entire week that way. You know, have you ever had, gone through a week and you look back on it and you go, what did I actually do this week? I mean, and, and what, what I did was I just got an autopilot. I mean, there, there, are things that I, that I, there are things on our list every single day that we know we've got to get done. We just don't want to do them. It's not, it's not comfortable. And so that's the difference right there is that intentionality of, of it's that making a decision. I'm going to be purposeful here in everything that I do. So that's that's pretty much that. Skillful versus resistant. Skillful means what is the absolute best of your ability? I'm going to choose. If I'm going to be disciplined, if I, if, I want, if I want to have more freedom in this life and I want to be disciplined, then I am going to do 
something to the best of my ability. I'm going to do everything that I can to the best that I can possibly do. What is the best that you can do? This is my favorite definition for success. John Wooden, who was the greatest coach in the world, said that so he defined success. And he, I mean, he wrote books. People wrote books about him based on his definition of success. He has the definition of success and then a big pyramid with about four dozen things of, of, of building blocks that, that, that explain his definition of success. It's really, really phenomenal. And basically it's this. He believes, and, and this is like one of the most winningest coaches in college basketball who's saying this is what success is. You're not even going to see the word win or hear the word win in this definition. Success is peace of mind, which is a direct result of the self-satisfaction that comes from you doing everything you can to be the best that you can possibly be. Now, I paraphrased that a little bit to actually read it. The quote, success is peace of mind, which is a direct result of self-satisfaction and knowing that you made the effort to do your best to become the best that you're capable of becoming. And that is, that's what it's about. I mean, that's what being skillful is. I mean, it's, it's I'm going to do everything I can to be the best that I can be. And then the opposite of skillful is resistance. There's always resistance inside of us. There's always a resistance inside of each one of us that says, don't go to the edge of my ability because it's awkward there. It's going to be, there's going to be failure there. It's uncomfortable there. It's unfamiliar there. I always, I always, you know, try to try to tell. I mean, when I'm when I'm helping students, um, student athletes, you know, to, to get a little stronger, you know, to, you know to, to understand what it feels like to get stronger, you've got to you've got to actually take your body to a place that it really hurt. I mean, I mean, while I'm saying not hurt or injured. I'm talking it's painful down here. You feel like you're gonna throw up sometimes. You you it's it's uncomfortable. It's unfamiliar. You might have to lift more weight than you ever lifted before. You might have to run so hard that you get a little bit nauseous. You know, some people don't know what that feels like. And, and, and so it's not going to kill you. It, it, but what it's going to do is it's going to actually extend you. It's going to make you a little stronger. It's going to make you a little better. So whatever the edge is for us, I mean, whatever that is, I mean, it, 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 we have to begin taking a step um, in that direction. Um, life is always going to be asking us to get better at things. You know, you're here because you want to get better at something. That just whatever it is, might just be life in general. Life is, I mean, our jobs are always going to ask us to get better. We're always going to be called upon to get better at things, to change something. And our situation is never going to improve unless we become more skillful in it. We have to seek to get more skill, to, to, to find out ways that I can understand um, uh, things better and do things in a better way. So I think to wrap up the discipline talk, and I want to, because I want to make sure that I point out those 15 ideas there that are really practical things that are on your sheet. I would say that discipline, understanding what discipline is and what it gives to us and what default is, like what default living is and just living by every day, impulse, default, you know, autopilot, resistance, what that kind of living is and what it takes away from us has to do with this. We understand that both of these are going somewhere. I mean, everybody every day is living in one of one one of these two. And so you wake up tomorrow, you basically use like I'm either going to live in a default, I'm going to live in this one. That's just the way. And, and so the people in our culture, in our organization, every single one of us, we're living in one of these two things every single day. And they're taking us somewhere. When when we're disciplined, we are in control of where we're going. That's the that's the thing. When we are disciplined, you are in control of your life. When we're undisciplined. We live in default. We're not in control. It's chaotic. It feels chaotic. And we know that. We know it's true. I mean, it happens. And then there are moments in life when we're just out of control. And the reason we're like, what's going on? Why are we out of control? We can usually point to, I'm living in a default way. I mean, again, it, what's it come back to all the time? What's culture come back to? What comes back to right here? It comes back to me. It comes back to me. It comes back to my choices, right? And so we all have the power to be in control of ourselves. Um, and that's what discipline is. It, it's, it's, it's a personal choice every single day, every single moment, really. So I wanted to give everybody 15 really good ideas for being the best version of yourself. And that's, that's kind of the thing that I want to kind of close on. And these are just 15 really practical ideas because if we didn't have practical stuff that we could take with us, then it would be, uh, it wouldn't be, it would just be a bunch of theory. 
So I don't want just this just to be the theory I want to have. So it's this, this stuff. It's on the right-hand side of the sheet if you brought the sheet with you. But when I say 15 things, like, here they are. Just show up. What if you might just show up? You want to run a marathon? Nope. Some people are like, no, I don't. But we'll just use that as an example, right? That'll be our example. If you want to run a marathon, then what happens is people tend to get overwhelmed with the idea of running 26 miles. Like, there's no way. But you know what? You know how that begins? You just put on a pair of shoes and you go out for a run. And you may get one quarter of a mile before you're breathing like crazy and you're having to bend over and, and do this. But you start it, right? That's what I mean by just show up. That, I mean, a, a lot of times the reason why people don't get things done in life is because they never do that. They never take that first step. You might find, you know what? All right, it might take me five years to train enough to be able to run 26 miles in one sitting. But you know what? You run a little bit every day, you'll get there in five years. I guarantee you'll get there in five years. So just show up. Start from the beginning. Number two, you don't just happen to stumble upon the best version of yourself. You have to, I mean, you've got to start at the very beginning. I mentioned the, the story about if I were going, you know, to go from one end zone to the next in a 100-yard football field. I, I, you know, I, I couldn't do it in a giant leap. I couldn't do it in 12 giant leaps. I, but I could do it with thousands of little baby steps. And, and, and so we just got to start from there and just keep right on going. Take a high number of those small steps. Number three, stop looking for secret tricks. There's no magic pills to anything that we're talking about. And, and I mean, everything that we talk about always comes down to those daily habits, those small things, those small little choices that, you know, just, just making the intentional uh, decisions to do those things. Nothing. It, I mean, here's the thing. You have to do the work. That's what I, I mean. It, we have to, if we want to get better, we have to do the work. And if you, if you go back and you take this to the teams that you work with, it really comes down to that. Listen, we just got to do the work. We've got, we've got to do the work that's going to make us the best we can be. Uh, number four, don't get bogged down with details. I think sometimes we get too detailed in our goals. We, 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 we have an idea that we want to reach, and, and you ever do reverse engineering where you say, hey, here's where I want to be in five years, or here's where I want to be at the end of this year, and then you, you plan it backwards. You say, what kind of things do I need to do incrementally to get to there? Well, sometimes I think we can, we can freak ourselves out so much by thinking about all those details that we, that we don't actually do, like what I said at the beginning, just show up. Just start, just start going. Just start taking, taking those steps. And so I think that that's one of the – we just got to go in the right direction. Uh, number five, recognize the opportunities that are available to you. What I mean by that is um, the internet has fundamentally changed the way like life happens. I mean, we all know that. I mean, the way behavior. I mean, what I mean, I mean, specifically what I'm talking about is this. Back, you know, if you want to get more skills, I talk about skillful versus resistance. If you want to get more skills and knowledge on things, you had to go and buy a book or you had to take a class or you had to, I mean, you, you had to get a degree in something, you know, like a, to be a mechanic or whatever, get an associate's degree. Well, you can watch YouTube now and learn how to work on things. And I've, I've done, I've worked on my lawn tractor. I'm not, I, have, I do not have any mechanical skills whatsoever. I always just give my cars and everything to somebody else to do and I pay them for it. But I have done more work mechanically just because of YouTube, because you can, you can go on the internet and say, well, what is the, what's, what's the sound it's making? And then I'll find it somewhere. Or I'll, I'll Google uh, something, a noise that my car's making and figure out, oh, that's probably what's happening to my car. And then I just go down this little rabbit hole. Of, of, and, and sure enough, that's what it is. And I didn't have to go pay for it. I, I fixed it myself. So those are the kinds of things that, I mean, we can do today. I mean, you can gain more skills just at, the, at our fingertips with no cost or whatever. So we need to recognize those opportunities are available to us. Um, number six, accept help from other people. Sometimes, sometimes we don't get better because we're too egocentric basically we don't think that anybody can help us to accept it you know don't let our pride get in the way um number seven this is a big one ignore the social media scoreboard i don't think i ever see people i would love to see a day when people will instead of like posing their best looking meal in there <laughs> and taking a picture of that or you know putting the family out underneath the cherry trees and, and, the, and the cherry blossom trees and taking the I just want to see somebody get up one morning and take a picture of the dirty dishes in the sink, you know, a little video of the kid whining and crying, saying they don't want to go to school, and saying, is anybody else's life like this? Because I mind. That's the way everybody's like this. The problem is social media creates the scorecard that is just impossible to live up to. And because we only see the best of everybody's lives, and it's just, turn that off. Just turn it off. I, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it really is, it's not beneficial to us whatsoever. And it's, 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 
it's not just, and I, I, the reason I put that on there is because we always look at all kids these days, kids in their social media, it's not kids. I, I mean, face, there ain't no kids on Facebook. <laughs> There's not. I mean, they have a Facebook account so they can show you the things that they want you to see. Everything else goes on the Snapchat or Instagram. Celebrate the small wins. Um, appreciating what, I mean, if you, if you have something that, I mean, just, if you make a, an intentional choice today, celebrate that. I mean, think about that. Yeah, yeah, that, that was, you know, be intentional about thinking about, that was a good, that was, that was it. That was discipline. Those little things, I mean, remind us that, okay, I am beginning to do things that I know I need to do to start this process of living a disciplined life. The reason I say celebrate the small wins is because the process of those small little things is so much more important than the ultimate goal. You'll get to the ultimate goal. We talked about that with goals and habits. You know, it, it's good to have the goal out there, but stop thinking about the goal. Just think about what I need to do right now. What do I need to do today? That, because that, the more I do what I need to do today, the closer I'm getting to that. But the more we think about that, the less we end up doing what we need to do today. And so celebrate the little things. Number nine, stop pretending to know things you don't know. I think a lot of times people, um, people don't try new things or they don't do things because they assume they already know everything about that kind of thing, uh, uh, whatever it is, I, I, uh, trying to, I had an example earlier that I was going to think of uh, to, about this particular point. Stop pretending to know things you don't know. Um, I think sometimes we, uh, we assume already that I can't do that. You know, if somebody challenges us with something, like, I know I can't do that. I know I'm going to fail. Well, no, you don't know that. I mean, you, you, you don't know that you can't do something uh, even if you tried it a hundred times and you failed. You don't, on the 101th time, you might succeed. You don't know that. And so I think a lot of times, when I'm, that's kind of what I mean by this point right here, is that, is that sometimes we need, to, we need to remind ourselves, no, I, 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 I'm going to try this again. Or I'm gonna, it's not always, you don't know what the result is going to be. Um, number 10, embrace failure. We are not going to become the best version of ourselves by always playing it safe. And that's that comfort zone thing, just living in the comfort zone, getting the edge. I, I, uh, I, I hate watching teams play. Um, you know, I, I always come back to sports, but I hate watching teams play out on the baseball diamond or softball diamond um, and never take any risks. And the reason why, a lot of times the reason why teams never take any risks, players never take any risks, is because as soon as they make an error or fail, mom or dad or coach is lying about it, right? And, and so one of the things that I try to change over the years in my, in my coaching, and I try to be more intentional about communicating this to the teams as well, is that I want you to make mistakes, but you better make them by being aggressive, not passive, right? So if, if, if we're going to have a mistake, I don't want it to be because you didn't lay out for that ground ball. It's going to be because you laid out for that ground ball and you just missed it. Right? And, or something, something happened because you were being overly aggressive. That's how we're going to make mistakes, not because we were holding back. And so uh, we want people to, to be free. So gonna embrace, embrace failure. Um, just doing the best that you can. Uh, you're going to fail sometimes, and that's, that's okay. Um, create a side project. You know, everybody needs like a side project. We need something. You know, this is you know, like, uh, some kind of thing outside work that really kind of makes you happy. You know, you know plant a garden. Um, for me, it's, you know, it's been coaching or writing, some people like photography, music, whatever it might be, just start doing it, you know, on times when you're, when you've got your time, you've got your time, you're not working on nights or weekends, who knows, sometimes those side projects turn into other, other opportunities. I mean, I'm a, I'm a living example of that right here, right now. I wouldn't be here talking to you if I hadn't written a book, and I didn't write a book so that I could be here talking to you, but what happened was, I've gotten the chance to come and speak here. I've been someplace in every couple of weeks. I did it uh, earlier this year. And there, those kinds of opportunities are coming up just because of creating a whole side project. You just never know what happens. Uh, practice gratitude. Uh, every morning, afternoon, night, take five minutes just to list things you're thankful for. It's one of the things I do in, my, in that morning routine. I get up at 445, go downstairs, take a big gulp of cold water, and then sit down with this little journal that I have that says three things that I'm thankful for. And you know, it just begins with that. And, and so, you know, take a, take a gratitude walk. I told our ambassadors today, I said, I know that I, I saw stress on top of their faces. Um, there was a big journalism test that they were all just kind of stressing out about. And, and uh, I said, man, there's no better day than today to take, to take like two minutes, walk around the road, and, that, and the whole time you're walking, the one thing I want you to think about or even say out loud are things that you're thankful for. 
because it is physiologically impossible to be grateful and stressed at the exact same time. Just try it. Just, I dare you to try it, right? If you, if you just if you start listing things that you're thankful for and grateful for, that stress is going to start to go away. Now, it might come right back when you're done, but, but that just reminds you, let's just stay thankful. Let's stay grateful. Gratitude is huge. It's huge. Uh, number 13, uh, we talked about this last time. Just 100% eliminate all complaining, blaming, and excuse me. You just can't stress it enough. Positivity will outperform negativity all the time. And that's just, that's just got to be done. Uh, number 14 is one I talk about with students all the time. Stop trying to find yourself, find your passion, or follow your passion. You know, passion isn't something that's out there somewhere. I mean, it's, it's here. You, you've got it inside of you. And so you know, the problem with talking about finding your passion and going there um, is, is that we're always assuming that our passion is going to be found somewhere else. Let's bring our passion with us every day. I mean, you may not be exactly where you want to be today or in this moment. You may not be working in the job you really want. You may not be you know, in, the, in a relationship that you really want or whatever. But when you bring, when you choose to bring your passion with you every single day and you, you have that with you, then, then what happens is your perspective on things begin to change. Maybe even you find that you really become passionate about where you're at. Or maybe you become so passionate you do such a great job that other opportunities open up for you. And then you can take your passion where you want it to be, right? But we just got to bring it with us. It's not out there somewhere. Take it with you. You've got it inside you. Take it with you. And then number 15, help others to be the best version of themselves. And I put that on there because that is really, I mean, every day, again, when I write in that little journal, one of the questions that I, that, that, well, it's kind of like a guided thing. And one of the questions it asks is, what, what will make today, uh, what, what, what can you do today to make today meaningful? And <laughs> my answer is almost the same every day, but it, but it's it's some kind of version of I want to be useful to somebody else. I want to, I want to instill positive energy in somebody else. I want somebody else to smile because of something I said today. Things like that. When you when, when that's our goal, then then I tell you that you are going to be becoming the best that you can be, the best version of yourself. Because then the focus isn't on you; it's on other people. I don't think there's any better way to, to kind of conclude than to say that. And so. Anybody else have anything or any questions? You want to get out of here today? I would add on your list, it says accept help from other people. And I would, I would even say ask for mm. help yeah. from other people. Like when I yeah. saw that, I'm like, sometimes someone might not know they need help. Yeah. It's like asking, and it kind, kind of goes down to your 15. When, you, and when somebody asks you, can you help me with this? It helps you be a better version of yourself by helping them. So. Yeah, that's really hard for me to do. Oh, it's, yeah. it's hard to yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's a great point. If you didn't hear it on the stream, live stream, she said, make sure you ask for help as well, not just wait for somebody to help you. Because I mean, I always know that you need help. So, awesome. I think that was everything. Oh, I, I had resources on there too, but it's, I, the same thing that's up here is on your sheet. So, yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.